waiting for us. The vote's still not quite over, so uh, our ranking member will get here soon. Um, I will take this opportunity to ask my questions. Um, I'm very concerned, Mr. Sakara Karia, that uh, we're kind of missing the point here. We have, in this rulemaking, we're adding a new step to rulemaking, which will lengthen rulemaking. And in all of uh, the language regarding hearings and, and, uh, and review, it refers to exceptional circumstances in order to skip uh, the steps necessary. So my question, and this is after I introduced the popcorn lung bill uh, regarding uh, diacetyl, and, uh, and that was just out of sheer frustration because OSHA's, uh, of OSHA's inaction. And uh, it just leads me to asking you questions of why adding this step is more important than uh, the, the three OSHA examples that Dr. Monforton would told us, talked about, and I talked about in my opening statements. Why do we need this statement, this standard, so urgently that uh, we've oper you've operated in an opaque fashion, leapt ahead of all other OSHA and MSHA regulations, uh, when what in your standards and in this this process is going to save lives. Madam Chair, there's nothing in the department's proposal here that necessarily lengthens uh, a rulemaking. An AMPRM, as I mentioned earlier, is not a new process. It's used often by OSHA already. In fact, the recent standards issued by OSHA began with AMPRMs. It is no secret that OSHA rulemakings take a long time that's due to a number of factors, not the least of which are the statutory requirements that Congress has put on the agency. Uh, OSHA has to comply with no fewer than eight statutes when it conducts a rulemaking. That, more than anything, is responsible for the length of time. Well, but and, and this rule, and, and Ms. Seminario and uh, Dr. Monfort to respond to this, see if, if maybe I'm wrong, this is going to add steps to the process. It's going to make it longer if, if you uh, prevail in, in what you're aiming at. Uh, I don't, actually, I don't think that that's the case, that an AMPRM can be conducted well, during the already statutorily required SABRIFA process. Okay, let process. me regain, regain my time and, and talk, turn it over to Ms. Seminario. Um, well, again, let's look at the rules that are pending that we are concerned about. Diacetyl uh, scheduled for a Sabrifa review that was supposed to start in um, January. Um, silica, a peer review requirement, which comes from the Bush administration directive that they have to conduct peer review. It's not a statutory requirement. It's a Bush administration policy, which this rule would now codify. Um, that peer review has been pending for four years. Sabrifa review on silica took place in 2003. So on its face, this rule says that OSHA has to go back now and conduct an ANPR, start all over, collect data, respond to all the comments, do review, redo their risk assessment, which is ready for peer review. So, so again, it does add a new step and particularly is uh, problematic for those things which have been in the pipeline for years, uh, which, are, which are underway. And again, it's not appropriate to use this mechanism for every rule. I'd also um, like to um, just state again that in terms of best practices, I don't see anything in the preamble to the rule that suggests that an ANPRM has been demonstrated to be a best practice. I think it would be really useful for someone to look at perhaps two OSHA rules where an ANPRM was issued and two issue rules, rules um, when it wasn't issued and look at the real quality of the information that comes in from an ANPRM. When the agency issues an ANPRM, there's no requirement, it doesn't have subpoena power to require information from 
companies or scientists to get information. And you're kind of at the mercy of whoever wants to send in information. And so you could actually look at what was submitted during that process and find out, does it really add anything to the, the quality of the product that ultimately comes out? Mr. Johnson. Just, Madam Chair, I know your time is limited, but just very quickly, ANPRM is, is a generalized way of gathering data because it asks generalized questions. It gets it in the hopper for people to look at and analyze. And the problems with an NPRM is traditionally it's, an, it's actually a proposed regulation, very specific. So it narrows, by definition, it narrows the constraints of those who can comment to that regulation. And, and the range of changes between NPRM and to a final rule as a, as a practical matter are, are, are very small. Uh, for APA reasons. So an ANPRM is a useful way to collect data up front, look at it carefully, and, and you're going to have to deal with those issues anyways. I don't really think it's going to result in delays in and of itself. Uh, but an agency can use that as an excuse for a delay. It really comes down to not the process itself, but I think the, uh, the desire of the agency to move forward for other reasons. Well, it's my understanding all of those questions have to come out in the final uh, r review, so why would we do it, uh, have it at the front and the back end. It does add. Steps it's all going to be. To it's all going to wind up in court. You may as well try and get, try and deal with them up front earlier on rather than later. Well, uh, and then again later. Uh, I'm sorry, my time is up, and I'm going to uh, yield to uh, Mr. Wilson for the purpose of questioning the witness. Says. Thank you again for being here and staying over too. Um, additionally, uh, Mr. Secretary, I appreciate your explanation. Uh, about the open process that's underway, uh, not secret, uh, one that uh, can be intelligible and very helpful in uh, receiving information to, to truly help uh, the people who are working in our country and who understand the significance of safety. In uh, written questions to, uh, which were sent uh, to the department by the majority, you provide an answer to this question. But can you explain for the record today upon what authority the Department of Labor took this policy change? Furthermore, why did the Department side decide to seek public comment on the proposed policy change? The proposals issued under the Secretary's general authority at 5 U.S.C. 301, this proposal is not a health standard, it's not a rulemaking, it's not issued pursuant to the Occupational Safety and Health Act or the Mine Safety and Health Act. It's issued pursuant to the Secretary's general authority to prescribe departmental procedures and process. Uh, as you noted, we weren't required uh, under the Administrative Procedure Act to seek public input or comment on this, but the Department thought that that was important to do. And so we expressly, affirmatively made that decision to put this proposal out and seek public comment on it. And which is ironic that some would call it secret, by the way, uh, anybody who's familiar with the Administrative Procedure Act knows that by definition a rulemaking is a public process. It's impossible to be secret. And, and further, I think you've explained this in letters of July the 17th, 2008 and September the 5th, 2008 to the Chairman. Uh, I'd like to uh, submit these for the record. Without objection. And indeed, I. Uh, in terms of worker safety, I'm, I'm pleased that uh, for the last six out of seven years there's been a reduction in the number of persons uh, injured and killed uh, in the workplace uh, across America. And uh, a person who I greatly admire is uh, my fellow home stater, uh, Ed Folk. And so be sure and tell Secretary Folk hello for me. I will. And Congressman, I would note, if I may, that not only are injury and illness rates declining, they're at the lowest level in recorded history under this administration. And, and I appreciate this coming out because uh, part of my service, I visit the different manufacturing facilities across uh, the district and uh, we're really uh, very pleased, in particular foreign direct investment. I've got three Michelin plants in the district I represent. We have Bridgestone Tire next door, which is Japanese. We have uh, Westinghouse Nuclear Fuels, which is uh, also Japanese. We have significant German, Swiss, uh, Swedish investments uh, in this uh, district that I represent. And uh, going by and visiting uh, the different uh, manufacturing facilities of flooring, of uh, oriented strand board, Canadian investment, uh, everywhere I go, obviously the very first point uh, that I see is safety. Uh, and it's uh, completely understanding that businesses cannot be successful and, uh, without uh, a healthy and safe uh, workforce. Uh, in addition to the fact, obviously, um, 
that the people who work at the uh, manufacturing facilities uh, live, work, and play with the families of the people who are the managers. Uh, so uh, over and over again, I've seen a positive uh, step. Uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, in your testimony, you reflect the Chamber of Commerce's uh, support for this regulation. How do you believe this regulation improves the regulatory process for stakeholders? Well, I, I think, I think it, it just brings together in one document all the different uh, procedures that the Department of Labor can look at in setting risk assessment. Uh, for example, I have an article here on the carcinogen policy which mentions that uh, uh, traditionally, uh, the current collection of policies and regulations is remarkable for the inconsistent and incomplete way in which suspect chemicals are treated. Because my experience at the Department of Labor was that it's, it's a very confusing decision-making process, who makes what decision on risk, what are they looking at. This tries to bring it in one document for the public to understand. But more importantly, it, it's just very simple. It requires, for example, all, all documents to be up on the web and be transparent and easily accessible. So, I mean, it used to be, Companies would have to hire law clerks to go down to the Department of Labor, Xerox uh, records, and bring them back in a paper file. And this makes it all much easier, and it's just common sense. And, and I, might, and, and I might just say that um, OSHA has always had a very robust doc docket. Um, even before there was regulations.gov, they've had an electronic docket with all the, uh, the uh, information up there. Um, it's also worth pointing out that this particular rule is, uh, was posted on August 29th on regs.gov, which I guess now is 18 days ago, and none of the documents related to this rule and its underpinnings have been posted as of this morning. And so all that appears on that public docket is the rule and then a number of uh, submissions of requests for extensions, but none of the underlying dockets. There was a big contractor's report that was done. Taxpayers spent $350,000 uh, in support of this. Um, and none of that information, none of the background behind this rule is on the web, and we have 12 days left to comment on it. And, and I would say that, um, that we are in the age of Internet, uh, which uh, makes access um, so readily available worldwide. Uh, and so I uh, would uh, hope and expect uh, that whatever shortcomings you see, that uh, you can bring them to the attention of good members of Congress, like Chairwoman Woolsey or me, uh, and we'll be happy to make inquiry. And uh, I would think, again, transparency uh, truly uh, is uh, beneficial. It's not negative. And I, I yield. Thank you. Mr. Payne, Congressman Payne. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I think that, you know, there, there is some dispute perhaps in certain industries and the one that the system sector is mainly familiar with that there has been a uh, a superb record of, of safety. However, I, I just want to uh, bring out that uh, perhaps you're not involved with the cleaning industry, for example, uh, Cintas, um, uh, as a large um, industry of, of, of uniform cleaning and cleaning of uh, uh, large um, laundries uh, have had uh, several deaths, two actually in my district about a year ago. Um, unsafe conditions where uh, workers were not given safety uh, equipment to clean out these big vats. Um, secondly, I'm not sure that anyone and maybe the building industry is not under uh, your jurisdiction uh, specifically, but uh, you've had a tremendous number of deaths in the construction industry this year in New York City alone. I mean, you've had almost one a uh, uh, a month easily, even more than that. Uh, crane safety, uh, safety of employees, uh, we've had a, an epidemic. So I, I, maybe South Carolina things are, are great, but I know up in New Jersey and New York, uh, we've had bad luck, perhaps. We, uh, you know, we don't get the hurricanes, but uh, evidently uh, we have other kinds of disasters uh, that uh, impact on human beings. That's, uh, I might um, just ask a, um, a question, Mr. Johnson, where you, uh, you object to the uh, designation of this program as a secret regulation because DOL, quote, has chosen to do this thoroughly uh, through a full public procedure, soliciting comments and input as with any other regulation. 
unquote. That was the quote. So I, I just kind of find it um, astonishing, actually, that, uh, that you claim that the department has solicited as much input as with any other regulation. So I, 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 I don't know if you would perhaps bring to my attention any other regulations or any other regulation uh, uh, which will uh, significantly affect OSHA or MSHA standards as this does uh, that did not have a hearing or more than a 30-day uh, uh, period of comment. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the ergonomics regulation, which which uh, uh, which is right here, uh, hundreds of pages long, uh, only had a 60-day comment period, uh, and that was issued during Thanksgiving week of 1990, uh, and we eventually got a, got an extension from that. Uh, yeah, I'm not, Congressman, whether 30 days is appropriate for this is distinguished from 60. I will say we often ask for an extension on on comments, um, and perhaps an extension from 30 days to 60 may be appropriate in this case. We asked for an extension, um, well, actually we didn't, but formaldehyde, benzene, hazard communication standards, I've worked on all of those, and traditionally the initial rulemaking period is quite short, and then traditionally there, there's an extension of comment. Uh, which had hearings or which did not, frankly, I have to go back and take a look at that. Whether or not a hearing is appropriate in this case, I'm not going to hazard a position on this and wouldn't take one. Yes. Let me just say that uh, with respect to, uh, to comment periods and on, on ergonomics, uh, Ergonomic rule was under development for years. Uh, there was a draft proposal with all of the background that was circulated to interested parties back in 1993. Um, there were public meetings. Uh, this went on for years and years and years, and so the notice that came out uh, in 19, um, whatever, or 1999 um, originally was, uh, was one that had you know, lots of public input prior to that. This rule came out of nowhere. This rule came out of nowhere. It wasn't in the regulatory <coughs> agenda. Um, we had no notice that it was coming. The first we saw of it was when the fact that it had gone to OMB uh, appeared on July, July 7th. Um, Mr. Johnson talked about when OSHA did its cancer policy. That was done under um, the Occupational Safety and Health Act. There were extensive hearings. I went to every day of those hearings. I think it was my first year at the AFL-CIO. Three months of public hearings at the Department of Labor on that policy. Um, ergonomics. We had months and months of weeks of public hearings on that. So um, bottom line here is that uh, 30 days is basically the shortest time possible for comment. Um, it certainly is not providing for the robust public comment, which the Bolton memo said agencies should be following in the uh, final months of the administration. Um, and, and also, uh, we think that a hearing on this is required given the way the department is doing it. They are essentially changing standards and standard setting under the Occupational Safety and Health and Mine Safety and Health Act. And both those laws say when a party objects and requests for a hearing, they have to be granted that hearing. We have put in that request, and we would expect that the department would follow the law. I, I do, as a, legal, as a technical matter, that this is the department saying this is not our standard, this is not a, a regulation, it's an mm. internal agency practice, and so therefore not technically subject to some of those requirements. But that's a sub separate as what, what might be the right thing to do. There's more public input. The gentleman's well, time thank, has expired. Thank you. Just, just if I might mention, I do recall also those hearings on economics and uh, how I was wondering when we were ever going to pass anything they had so many hearings on it. And so I think to say, well, you got 60 days is kind of uh, not uh, uh, as far from, from the truth. I thought it went too long before the regulations were, came out. Thank you. Congressman Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. My apologies. I was at a, a markup on, on veterans. Um, so I, I didn't get to hear the testimony, but I, I just have I'm troubled here, Mr. Sakara. Maybe you could help me out. Uh, was anyone in OSHA or MSHA consulted on this proposed rule? Yes. They were. And did they ask you to issue the rule? I'm sorry, did? Did the agencies ask you to issue the rule after you consulted with them? Did they? The reason, I'm, I guess I'm curious why the rule's coming out of the DOL policy office and not the health and safety agencies. Uh, yes, I understand that uh, that you weren't here for the earlier testimony, Congressman, but as I mentioned earlier, this proposal is issued pursuant to the Secretary's general authority 
to issue regulations and related to the department's procedures. It's not issued pursuant to the Occupational Safety and Health Act or the Mine Act. Mm -hmm. Well, in my opinion, it seems like it's it's going to be tying the hands of any future administration, which I would, to be candid with you, I would consider shameful because of how long it currently takes OSHA and MSHA to issue standards and the fact that OSHA uh, has issued only one major standard during this administration and they were ordered to do so under court order. So I, I do have a concern about that. My other couple of concerns is wh why move forward on this proposal after 80 epidemiologists, as I understand this, and physicians in the American Public Health Association advised the Secretary of Labor to withdraw the proposal for reasons that it would be damaging to workers' health. I mean, doesn't that kind of fly in the face of what the experts are saying? And I, I, I may, maybe you could help me try to understand why you folks know more evidently than these uh, epidemiologists, physicians in the Ameri American Public Health Association? Well, I don't know precisely which experts you're referring to or what their specific argument <coughs> is. Um, people may have different views about the regulation. That's the purpose mm -hmm. of a notice and comment period, is so that we can collect those views from the public. Um, as for delay, as we discussed earlier, an AMPRM and a health rulemaking does not necessarily lengthen the time it takes to do an OSHA rulemaking. Those rulemakings take a long time. Much of that time is required by Congress because of statutes Congress has passed. And in addition, uh, they take a long time because of the inevitable lawsuits. But, but there are nearly, have been nearly two dozen lawsuits, including some filed by members on this panel against OSHA in But didn't you bypass standard procedure for proposing the rule? For example, it's for example, it's, it's was not announced in the most recent semi-annual DOL regulatory agenda, and which is in, vi in violation of Executive Order 12866. You only provided 30 days for public comment, rather than the customary 60 days as laid out in the, under the executive order. So there's no public hearings. You've not made any of the underlying documents related to the rule part of the public docket. So can you explain to me why that I, why that happened? My understanding is some people have requested a public hearing. The department will consider those requests. Mm -hmm. Again, unlike the OSH Act and the Mine Act, there's no requirement for the department to conduct a public hearing. The item was not listed on the spring regulatory agenda of the department, and that's for a simple reason. The spring regulatory agenda lists regulations the department is pursuing. So you're comfortable with the 30 days instead of the 60 days for comments and people being able to testify about it? Uh, well, Congressman, we're in the middle of an open rulemaking and a notice and comment procedure, and I'm not going to prejudge at this point what the appropriate time for comments is. The department's in its initial proposal said 30 days. As I understand it, we've, re we've received requests, but I'm not prepared here today to judge requests that I haven't even seen about whether we should extend that comment period. Well, I understand that, but I just don't understand why standard procedure for proposing the rule, uh, which is in violation of Executive Order 12866. And I'm just wondering if that, if, if you are comfortable with going against the executive order 12866. Well, Congressman, I respectfully disagree with your characterization that it's not in compliance with executive order 12266. Okay. Um, Dr. Monfort, and you mentioned in your testimony, I'm sorry if I mispronounced no, again. No, correct. Okay, thank you. Well, I get, I'm getting something right here today. You, you said in your testimony that this proposed rule would be quite damaging to workers by further paralyzing the rulemaking process. I wonder if you could, you know, go into more, more detail on how it would do that. I'd be happy to. Um, as numerous people have said here, regulating occupational health hazards takes a long time. There are numerous steps in the process, including numerous steps that have been um, instituted by this administration and under the previous Congress under Sabrifa. And it's my feeling that probably the best thing to do would take a step back and look at all of these requirements for Sabrifa panels, for peer review, and all of that, and really decide if those things are necessary and add to the quality of the final product. The objective here for these statutes is to prevent harm, prevent workers from developing disease and disabilities. And if we have too many steps along the process, we never get to the final product. And it's not about the process, it's about the workers in the end who are harmed and develop diseases or die um, because of exposures at work. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just add to that? Um, when the National Academy of Sciences looked at what OMB had proposed back in 2005 on risk assessment, they put out a 
a proposed bulletin. It went through public uh, comment. It had an NAS panel. Um, they had a lot of criticisms uh, of the bulletin. But one of the main criticisms that they had was that bulletin with all of its additional requirements that the uh, administration hadn't done its own sort of cost-benefit analysis as to whether or not adding all these additional requirements had any benefit had any benefit with respect to the outcome, and the benefit being not one of process. The, the point of the Occupational Safety and Health Act and Mine Act, as uh, Dr. Mumfortin said, is to protect workers, all right? That should be the main goal. So how does this add to the protection of workers? And I would say that in looking at this proposal here, um, it does nothing in that regard and, and would be quite, uh, quite de detrimental. Uh, and so, Again, I think imposing additional requirements is not needed. And, um, and as I said, NAS also said that agencies needed to look at that when they were developing their risk assessment uh, approaches to see if it added anything and was necessary and shouldn't lose sight of what essentially the purposes of their statutes were. The gentleman's uh, time has expired. Uh, I'm going to ask a question, and the ranking member is going to uh, give us his closing remarks and then I'll give my closing remarks and you'll all be excused. But let's get to what I think the main question is, uh, Mr. Secretary. The White House Chief of Staff, Joss Bolton, issued a memo in May stating that no new regulations should be proposed after June 1st, 2008, absent extraordinary circumstances. Can you describe extra why the, well, describe the extraordinary circumstances in this case? Why is this extraordinary? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, respectfully, I disagree with your characterization of the Bolton Memo, and in fact does not say that agencies cannot issue regulations after June 1st. What does it say? No. I don't have a copy in front of me. Read it, please. I said I don't have a oh. copy in front of me. I'm sorry. Well, we, well, I have a copy. Yeah, and that is what it says, right? And it says, except in extraordinary circumstances, regulations to be finalized in this administration to, should be proposed no later than June 1st, 2008, and final regulations should be issued no later than November 1st, 2008. So either they are um, I'm sorry, out, of asking the question. out of compliance with the memo, yeah. or they don't intend to finalize it, by the end of this administration. So let our, my question to you is what are the extraordinary circumstances in this case other than putting one more roadblock into OSHA procedures to save life and health of workers? The department has not cited any extraordinary circumstances with regard to this rulemaking. Then uh, why is this rulemaking more important than diacetyl, for example. I've, I've never said that it is, Madam Chair. Well, it's being, it's preempting other actions that should be taken. Actually, I don't believe that it is. This regulation oh. is rather short. Um, I think in a Word document, it's maybe 25 pages long. Uh, the three most recent standards issued by OSHA, I believe, were somewhere in the order of 400 to 700 pages long. The Cranes and Derricks rule yeah. that they're currently working on is in excess of 1,200 pages. Well, it doesn't matter how many pages. Who's getting, life is being saved. Whose health is better because of, of what we're doing? Uh, Mr. Johnson, you had something you wanted to say, then I'm going to ask uh, our two women oh, yeah, witnesses I, to I, 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 It was just close. on the last round of questions. It was, it's true that obviously the OSHA Act was intended to protect workers, which is not a limitless discretion, grant of discretion to OSHA to, to, to create a risk-free environment. The OSHA Act also contains quote, that the Secretary in promulgating regulations must use the best available evidence and the latest available scientific data in the field. Best available evidence, latest scientific data in the field. Those concepts are from the statute. They're in the, they're in the, the quality guidance. Of okay, thank you. I don't see how that relates to the new standards, but we'll see. Uh, uh, Mrs. Seminario and then uh, Dr. Uh, Monforton is going to be our cleanup batter for the witnesses. You go. Uh, Ms. Seminario, you're first. Oh. I just want to reiterate and make sure the committee understands that in the regulation, it specifically says that when MSHA and OSHA 
make major steps in rulemaking, such as proposing a rule that documents are to be published on regulations.gov within 14 days. Okay? And this, uh, this pr proposal purports to be something about best practices, but they don't follow their own because there's nothing in regulations.gov that supports this rulemaking. They haven't even followed their own best practices that they're proposing in this rule. It's very problematic when you're trying to comment on a proposed rule when you don't have any of the substantive documents that, that um, were used to develop it. Okay, thank you. Ms. Seminario, you are our cleanup batter. Um, just, to, um, just to say that, again, this rule is being put forward in the name of improved um, transparency and notice to the public. But with the rule, no notice was given that it was even under development. Uh, and certainly, as far as um, transparency, um, we've had a little information. And as far as opportunity for comment, there's virtually none. And so it violates, uh, as Dr. Morton said, what's being proposed here. But, but more importantly, it will hurt workers. It will delay rules, uh, very important rules like diacetyl and silica, which will mean that workers will be exposed. We've gone through seven and a half years. It'll be eight years come January um, 2009, with only one occupational health rule being issued. Uh, and we would like the next administration to move forward quickly uh, to put those standards in place. Uh, to propose the silica rule, the diacetyl rule, so workers aren't exposed and their lives can be saved. That's what we think the priority of the next administration should do uh, be, uh, not uh, starting all over at the beginning of the process. Thank you. Mr. Wilson. And thank you, Chairwoman uh, Wilson, uh, for this hearing today. And uh, I appreciate all of the witnesses, your uh, input. Uh, I uh, want to thank the Secretary and the Department uh, I wish you well as we're all uh, working somewhat together uh, and, and working on behalf of uh, reducing uh, workplace accidents and deaths. And so uh, thank all of you for being here today. And I want to thank the uh, staff, too. I tell you, Lauren Sweat is an amazing uh, person putting up with us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being here today. Uh, you're excellent witnesses. It was very informative, and I believe there's one issue in all of the discussions that we can agree on, and that there are major problems at OSHA and MSHA when it comes to issuing protective standards. However, we do differ on the nature of the problem. Uh, DOL seems to think that the paralyzed regulatory process requires even more years of review and even more delay. Uh, however, for those of us who believe that OSHA's and MSHA's job is to protect America's workers, the real problem is the inexcusable delays in standard setting, uh, which is actually leaving workers exposed to deadly hazards. Congress gave OSHA and MSHA broad authority to issue and enforce strong workplace safety and health standards. Over the years, the courts and this administration also have made it tougher to issue these standards, adding even more time to the process. We need to look at ways to reform the standard making process so that it actually provides workers with the protection that they need on a timely basis. But this administration has utterly failed to fulfill its obligation to the American worker. While it should have been working full speed ahead to issue protective standards, it has instead been busy with this secret rule a rule that subverts congressional intent to help workers, and it is being rushed through without proper consideration. Again, I want to thank the witnesses for your testimony, uh, particularly coming to us on such short notice. And I want to assure you that we will continue to fight right here uh, for American workers to ensure that uh, any ill-conceived proposal won't see the light of day, particularly this one. So, as previously ordered, members will have 14 days to submit additional materials for the hearing record. Any member who wishes to submit uh, follow-up questions in writing to the witnesses should coordinate with majority staff within 14 days. And without objection, the hearing is adjourned.